So let's just have a think about what's the reality of our audience if we want to, to change them, or actually to understand how we're going to influence them. Roughly in the UK, uh, we don't have specific figures for, for Wales. I will say where there are figures for Wales, I will use them, but actually you'll see a lot of the case studies and stuff. It has tended to be um, England and Scotland who've done more of the pilot work than, than in Wales for whatever reason, but that's just how it is. But hopefully we've got a, a new Wales project coming on already here, so that's great. But around 8 million dogs uh, in the UK. Um, and it's a great influence about where people go, what they do. Um, dogs accompany people on around half of all visits to the countryside and green space. That is a, a Natural Resources Wales figure. Um, and conflict can occur and does occur. If you think about half of all those visits, people have got a dog with them. Even if it's 0.00001% of people who actually have conflict, that will feel like a big issue if that's your farm or you've just trodden in the poo uh, in the, in the um, park or something like that. So even a small percentage is going to feel like a big problem. But as you've said here, there's significant benefits for health and people being out and social cohesion, people talking to people and that sort of thing. So there's benefits too. Dog owners are particularly protective of existing access. Uh, and so if you're going to make any changes, actually think about how we engage with that and recognise that because it's a really valuable amenity to them uh, is important. And what I would say is that actually if every dog walk was causing problems or people weren't picking up or that sheep were being chased every time dogs were walking on farmland, it would be Armageddon. You know, we wouldn't be able to walk without dog poo, all the sheep would be dead, uh, and we know that isn't the case. But in some situations, it is a significant problem. So we have to develop solutions that work with particular cases uh, because that's the way we get things to work, to work best. So who are our dog owners? I mean, dog ownership particularly goes across pretty much all social sectors, be it from... Uh, retired, working class, um, middle income, whatever it is. Um, UK average is about a dog in every about 23% of homes. In Wales, it's much higher. It's about 33%. So if you think of that just in terms of votes as well, you know, the political reality that, that actually, um, particularly because dogs are often seen as just as much as a member of the household as, say, a child, you can see that doing something dog-friendly from a political perspective can be quite important. The, most, the thing that's most often associated with a dog being in the home is also children. So again, that's helping us think about, okay, so how do we manage this issue when people want to go with their children to play with their, um, on the swings and stuff in the park, and how do we manage that with, with dogs? Uh, you can get some very sociable dog walkers. You will see them in different places, whether it's your country parks or your town parks or whatever, who will know the dog's name before the owner's name, and they'll know if that person doesn't turn up in the morning that maybe we need to check if they're okay. But there's also antisocial dog walkers like me, whereas if I've spent a whole day chatting with people, I just want to shut up at the end of the day and be sick of hearing my own voice and actually want some peace and solitude. So again, that maybe help, helps to explain why you can't just corral everybody into one place because people value green space for all sorts of reasons, not just because they have a dog. You can have some first-time visitors, which is a bit uh, like this project that we're talking about here. And, and those people who are coming at first are the people that are really keen for good information about where can I go, what can I do. And that's the great opportunity to actually guide them to places where actually if you go to this sort of place or that sort of place, you're less likely to meet sheep. Or actually if you go this way, your dog will need to be on a lead. But if you go to this place, there's a dog-friendly cafe and there's some off-lead exercise areas and stuff like that. So that's very different to say your local residents who will know all that information and will have certain routes that they use on a day-to-day -day basis. So we need to sort of segment that market and remember that providing information needs to be tailored to the audience. It's not just all one group that's the same. Some people, particularly if they're local residents, will be thinking about having access, uh, particularly in winter, sort of before the sun comes up and after sundown, which again if affects if you've got country parks and places where the barriers are shut when it gets to dusk, where are those people going to walk their dogs? Um, you get some people who are very active and involved in dog sports, whether it's agility, it could be canny cross, which is cross-country running with, with your dog. But equally, there are people who won't be taking any exercise or visiting your green space or all those sort of things if they didn't have a dog. Um, so again, it's all very broad. So actually, restrictions on dogs are restrictions on people. Now, those restrictions might be really very valid, but it's thinking about it's not really a restriction on dogs. It's about people and where they go and what they do. Just thinking about the, the tourism angle, because I know whilst this is predominantly for land and access managers today, we have some people who have come from a tourism angle as well, so it's important we give you a bit of that context. And also just the potential of what this can do in terms of economic regeneration for the area. And this is some, some work that was uh, done over last winter, 
uh, and it's saying that 89% of people with dogs take their pets on holiday. So you can see all of a sudden that's changing how they would decide where to go. Uh, I love this one, 10% of them would rather take their dog on, a w on holiday and leave their partner behind than the other way around, uh, which actually obviously depends on their partner. But again, it just shows that, that bond that people have. Uh, in the UK, dog owners spend uh, nearly £390 million extra each year to take their pet on holiday. So again, and that spend in the local area and all sorts of things like that. Nearly half wouldn't go on holiday without their pet. 31% of people take their dogs on two holidays a year, rising up to 6% who take them six times a year. So again, when you start looking at it, potentially a really big market. And 85% of dog owners will research before they go somewhere to see how dog friendly somewhere is. So it's not just being dog friendly when you get here, it's actually influencing when people make that choice when they're just about to book about whether they decide to go to here or Pembrokeshire or Cornwall or the North York Moors or whatever it may be. As you've told me here, dog ownership uh, is associated through lots and lots of studies about giving people the confidence to go in the outdoors, the daily motivation to take exercise in, in whatever the weather's doing. We know that people with dogs go to the doctor less, have lower suicide rates, have better mental health, less likely to commit suicide, make quicker recoveries from operations, all sorts of things which, which you know, help the wider scheme of things. So this whole idea of what we're going to talk about today is again how we promote this stuff but also deal with these things at the same time.